Hey guys, welcome to the channel. I am talking about Chris Watts's book, chapters three, four, and five. And in it, it talks about Sandy and then it talks about Cindy. Now the book's not all put together, so it's kind of pieces here and there. So um, I will say that I was right on point on uh, Cindy Watts. All of My Broken Pieces by Cindy Watts and Kathleen. Edit. The formatting was lost in the pasting. Some of the book, Cindy seems to be responding to Sandy R's letter from the case discovery. It's easy to tell when it is happening, but FYI, in case you're wondering why it sounds like Sandy talking. Oh, and Jamie Watts is under the alias Sarah. Not sure why. <clears throat> I decided to write this book after several months of observing the Chris Watts case, not because it was an interesting case, though it is, but more so because there was never, there never seemed to be any clear motive. I don't believe that anyone without a violent past or some sign of mental illness would simply turn around one day and murder a pregnant woman and two little girls because they met somebody new. That didn't wash for me. I've written and researched strange crimes before, and this definitely looked like one. There was a pretty obviously strained marriage and a lot of questions, many of them both medical and financial. The crime itself was the worst that can be committed, killing children, and for that, to my mind at least, there are no mitigating circumstances except, I guess, insanity. Was he insane? Was she? Or could it have been drug use? Some kind of amphetamine might cause this. What was in those patches? Some miracle weight loss because he looked astounding in his before and after photos? Or was it simply speed, which explained the weight loss, lack of sleep, as reported by him and his girlfriend, and his seemingly over-the-top energy? Amphetamine rage makes people do the most horrible things. I remember the Jeffrey McDonald case, a pregnant woman and two little girls of exactly the same ages. The late writer Joe McGinnis had, I thought, proved in the semi-final fatal vision beyond, an out, but beyond a doubt that he had indeed killed his family, as had the prosecutor in North Carolina. North Carolina Fayetteville, so close to where Christopher and Shanann Watts grew up and met. Odd that. Yes, it was similar to Jeffrey McDonald, wasn't it? The handsome young doctor, who had no history of violence, but had in one terrible hour destroyed all of their lives, his included. Why? The only answer that made sense is that is the, if that is the right word, were those diet pills. And diet pills, at least back then, were amphetamines. Could this tragedy have occurred again? Maybe so. You can buy anything on the internet and try as I might. I can find a lab test on the ingredients in those patches he was covered in. Well, so was she. Was that what happened? Then again, I didn't think she looked like she could be using speed. She wasn't fat. She wasn't thin. She looked normal. But then there were all those illnesses and maybe an elective neck surgery and at least some of those must have led to OBA use. And that's really just heroin, and people don't always behave normally on heroin either. So, okay, drug. Drug use seems to be a big possibility. I'll look into if I decide, if I've decided the medical records are sealed, but old fashioned investigating might turn up some kind of proof. We'll see. Then there were the respective families. That's always a horrible thing to witness, whether you are them or not. The grief, the endless pain. And in the last couple of decades, that pain is always made a million times worse by having your every single act since the day you were born scrutinized by millions of people on the internet, along with the usual media, and that's just for the parents of the victims. They don't get a pass either. It's the wild, wild west on the net. And since all of us can know everything, we usually want to. Then there were his parents. They looked so nice and so terribly devastated. They looked lost. Did the son they loved so much and thought, as all parents must, that they knew so well? Could he done this awful thing? How could he have? Why, why, why? 
I saw that they were being tried and were losing in it. The court of a public opinion. This aspect was also both interesting and puzzling to me for at least for at nearly the same time that the Watts family was imploding into violent murder in Colorado, a beautiful woman and her two fairly breathtaking young daughters were shot and killed in a million dollar home in San Antonio, Texas. As in the Watts case, the possible suspect of the crime's mother came forward and spoke of her love for her son, her certainty that he could never have done this thing. Funnily, the all, that also happened in the McDonald case long ago, but no one hated Mrs. McDonald for her loyalty to her son. No one seems to feel that way about Miss Wheeler in Texas either. Save. Possibly the family and friends of Nicole Olson and her daughters. It's odd, isn't it? Who we choose to judge and who we don't. I wonder why this mother was singled out for so much hatred, for doing what mo most mothers always do and are in fact expected to do, to love their children no matter what. There were people who even seemed to think the Watts family did not love or miss their small granddaughters because they still loved their son and were asking questions. It was obvious from the beginning that neither of them were fond of Shanann. Well, we're being honest. Few mothers and daughter-in-laws are all that close, but this one seemed worse than most because his parents were at the wedding and weren't at the wedding and there was Nutgate. Most daughter-in-laws don't make loads of Facebook postings which basically accuse their mother-in-laws of attempting to murder their grandchildren. But this one had, wow, yikes. There was, I knew, quite a backstory there and I wanted to know what it was. I also was beginning to feel sorry for Chris Watts' family that hadn't killed anyone, allegedly, or in real life. All they had done, as far as I could see, was keep loving their own child, and don't all parents do that, no matter what, aren't you supposed to? The both crime they were committing was not saying anything about their grief at Shanann. So, okay, I thought, they aren't being hypocrite. Hip hypocrites. After all, they were only a couple weeks beyond the attempted murder allegations of Netgate when the real murders occurred. People sanctify the death, the dead a lot, and that's normal, I guess, unless it's Hitler or somebody. On the other hand, if someone you have disliked heartedly for a long time dies, someone maybe you had been in a terrible fight with says, because they called you an attempted child killer on the net and dies, is it anything but pretty gross hypocrisy to go on TV and tell people how much you love them and how much you miss them? To me, the answer is no. Okay, fine, moving on. Now I had other questions. What is it like to be a completely average, nice, hardworking American family one day and becoming America's most hated family, a warning to young children the next day? To say it would suck is probably the biggest understatement on planet Earth. I decided to talk to them if I could. I wrote a letter after a while. Cindy wrote me back. Uh, it was such a polite, sad little letter, and she broke my heart. Politeness in the face of all that, and to a writer, wow. Over the next few months, we began to write more and then to talk. She was even kinder and sadder and more terribly lost than she appeared on TV. I spoke to her husband, Ronnie, a sweet, old-school, hard-working Southern gentleman. And then to hear really wonderful daughter to hear really wonderful daughter and I started to not just like them but to feel protectively about these nice people who let's face it had done nothing wrong so there you are the reason for the book and why I'm hoping to find out over the course of it but it's not just my book it's Cindy's too she needs a place to tell her story and to explain her feelings and history with her son and Shanann and her granddaughters she needs a place to try to explain to find out for herself what really happened or to try because Shanann and Celeste and Bella are gone now. They are beyond our questions and beyond caring about our judgments now. This book is for the living, their stories about before and after. It gives the information about uh, the author. And then All My Broken Pieces, A Story of Motherhood and Love and Loss, Cindy Watts. 
Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Lewis Carroll. Why, why, why? Only God knows why. Kid Rock. I don't know why that's in there, but it is. I don't think even once, not when I was a little girl even, that I expected or wanted everyone in our country to know my name. Maybe every little girl's dreams of being a princess and now an internet star. But they didn't have internet stars when I was a kid and they don't have prin and they didn't have any princesses or stars at all. When I've always where I've always lived, except for those in the sky. If anyone has been interested or asked me ten years ago what I wanted, I would have told them I already had it. A good marriage to a fine man and two wonderful children. By back then I have to qualify and say that I mean back before my son married a woman that was wrong for him and began to lose himself and we began to lose him as well. Our pain started then and over the next eight years our lives tilted downward, downhill and became sadder, more complicated and filled with growing amounts of unwanted drama and fear until we finally ended up here at the bottom in a damaged grieving heap broken into pieces. Two of our granddaughters are dead. The young woman who was our daughter-in-law, is dead, and her family is devastated as well. Our boy is in many ways as lost to us as though he was dead. Our family is in rubble, and those, and the whole world seems to know our names and hate us. We just exist and try to breathe through permanently constricted throats, trying to find a way, any way at all, to go on living for what we have left, who we have left, including each other in our own new reality, which is simply moment by moment wreckage. I'm not writing this book to ask for sympathy. I'm writing it because there are always three sides to every story. Hers, his, and the truth. Maybe I cannot know the truth any more than all the millions of strangers worldwide who seem to think they do. But I know some things. I know our family, I know my son, or maybe I don't, and I wish to gain understanding of him and his actions through this process. And to a degree, I know the story of the marriage that led us all here. I want to tell people about these things I know at least. As to what I hope will come of it, well, I don't hope for much more. But no matter what you think of me, of us, remember this. Chris is still my child, and if you have ever had and loved children, then you wish to hold them and comfort them when they are damaged. You wish to make it right. I can't make this right, and I may never hold my son again, never be able to comfort him. I can tell my story, though, or my truth, if you will, and hope for understanding. This is a story of us before, during, and after this slide. It's the story of our son meeting and Mary and Shanann, and what occurred during their marriage. It's the story of our granddaughters as we knew them, and our sons' lives during those years and their aftermath. This is about us, a group of ordinary people, as we actually are, and not as those who think they know us or might wish us to be, because if what they say of us were true, then something like this could never happen to you or someone you love, and that reassurance I can't give anyone anymore. As painful as the words of strangers are, those who know nothing of us but feel they do, I hold no grudges. I might have thought the same as they do before, when it wasn't us, before meaning, before my family became one of those the people read about, and shaking their heads over and then immediately running to their laptops to say such thing as, I guess I would have drowned him at birth, or if that wasn't personal enough, this, they speculate about whether it was me or my husband, Ronnie, who is the psychopath, and whose horrible parenting or genes, take your pick or choose both, has twisted uh, our boy so bad that he was always destined to grow up to become a family annihilator. The worst, of course, the very worst. And I think what truly drove this book is people who have written that my beautiful young grandson is going to grow up to be another Chris. God help you to find more kindness for an innocent boy and maybe to find in these pages the answers that aren't any real answers. I mean as to know how this tragedy happened or what could have stopped it because can't you see that if you could have we would have? Please if nothing else believe that. I'd like to thank you the reader for listening to my story and for giving me 
your time as I travel this road again. Chris was a really good kid. It's not just me who says so. Everyone who ever met and knew him said so too. He was very gentle and quiet and never caused us a single problem. He was an honor student who loved sports and made a nice life for himself in Mooresville, North Carolina, after high school and then NASCAR Tech. Then he met Shinian. Chapter 1. Everybody talks about their dreams for their children, but I think I can safely say that there is only one that we parents have. We just want them to be happy. Of course, there is bigger dream. And in many case, cases, nothing harder to achieve. And the difficult thing is that we really can't do one thing about helping them to be happy. That's mostly down to luck, I think. Our boys' luck ran out pretty early on. I don't think I worried about him much when he was little. He was such a good kid. And in high school, he played baseball and got straight A's. So I didn't have any reason to worry. But I did anyways, because he was so incredibly shy and quiet, and I didn't want him to be lonely or missing out on all the silly adventures that we parents complain about but expect anyway, and then later shake our heads over and laugh. He was terribly serious at an age when most kids aren't. Our daughter was so busy and overscheduled with friends and boyfriends and keeping AT&T in business and pushing our rules that it was hard not to notice the differences between them as teenagers. Still, when more could I have reasonably wanted than a son who did all the right things and just seemed to enjoy going to NASCAR, seeing races with his dad while maintaining high grades and playing sports, and yet, okay, I'd hear from my mother, who the kids called Oma, and the school pickups, about the school pickups. I was working, and so she would go and collect the kids for me after school. She'd drive up to get Chris from his elementary school, and promptly out he would come, my sweet boy, ambling out the door, giving her his quiet smile and saying thank you as he got in the car to wait with her for his sister. Wait, they did too. Sarah was so popular that it could take her a half an hour or more after school to say goodbye to all her friends that she would get a chance to talk to by phone for an hour or so. It used to drive my mom crazy. Both my kids were born kind. It just seemed that Sarah never met any stranger in her life and Chris, well, he liked people just fine, but he came out reserved and quiet just like his dad and he stayed that way. He had a few close friends and I guess if I wondered how it would go for him later, and I did because I am a mother. I hope that somewhere out there ahead of him was a sweet girl who would think like I had about Ronnie and value him for what he was. She would, I hoped, simply enjoy being with my sweet, good, hardworking boy and build a life with him. With Sarah, I knew she never, she had her pick and pick right when she was ready and she did. She went to college, fell in love with Steve, married him and started her career and her living happily ever after in the usual smarter, small starter house. With Chris, I didn't know so much as hope for the best. He was so shy, in fact, that a girl had to ask him to the senior prom. So I think, if I remember correctly, I guess I knew he'd have to meet a pretty outgoing girl to bring him out of his shell. I knew that when he had did that, he'd be completely devoted to her and try his very best to make her happy. And since he is so much like his dad, I figured her chances for that were better than average. After high school, Chris, who like his dad, could fix anything mechanical that had been invented had set his sights on the NASCAR Academy, and so off he went at 18, and after he completed his schooling there, he was hired by Ford dealership in Monroeville. He always, he's always been a hard worker, and he liked the work too, and he, and he, we, had raised both our kids to be careful about money. For a while there, it seemed like he had learned it too, because he started right off by saving up about every cent that didn't go to rent and food. And before too long, he had bought a brand new car, a Ford Mustang, and he only owed $8,000 on it, while managing to put another 11000 into savings, which is pretty good for a young man of 24. Ronnie and I, careful people, so nothing about Chris's finances surprised us then. 
In what spare time Chris had, he continued his lifelong enjoyment of exercise and being outside and coming down to visit us and his sister and our new family member, Sarah's little boy, Wyatt. And of course, he took every opportunity to go see NASCAR with his dad. I was glad of that too. I love Ronnie, but those races are too loud for me and I don't think I was missed. Those two loved hanging out together. Our family stayed close and we saw a lot of Chris. Despite the three hour drive from Monroeville to Spring Lake, he and Wyatt had become best friends too. And Uncle Chris made was always a favorite visitor for him and Sarah and Steve were expecting their second baby, which we were all overjoyed about. I think we were all happy in that simple way of being so without noticing it. I guess by that, I mean things were on track. Our kids were doing well and their entries into adulthood had become had almost been a paint by numbers deal. School, jobs, marriage, and a baby for our oldest and Chris was so young that we weren't at all concerned that he hadn't met anyone special yet. Then we got a call from Chris that he in fact met a girl and she was special and he wanted us to meet her too. Sarah, who is far who is by far the most outgoing member of our family, decided to host a barbecue. Nothing big, just a casual little thing, with a few friends and family. We weren't nervous exactly but we were all a little surprised because Chris had sheepishly announced to us that his new girlfriend was 40. And since he was only 24, well, I can't say what I thought. I was definitely curious though. When Chris arrived, it was with a young, pretty, dark haired woman. Her name was Shanann King, and she didn't look anywhere near 40. Ronnie didn't seem to be bothered by it. But Sarah and I did a little whispering in the kitchen, wondering why Chris had told us that she was so much older then she obviously was. Finally, we asked him. He grinned and brought Shanann over and they laughed and said it had been her idea and wasn't it hilarious. We laughed too, but to this day, I've never figured out why she wanted us to think she was so much older. Still, Chris seemed to like her a lot and she was very friendly and outgoing and who gets every joke anyway. So we weren't worried. I suppose we were happy he'd found someone he liked enough to want to introduce us to and seemed to have a lot going for her, an extraordinary amount of things actually. She was, as it turned out, only a year older than Chris and she was pretty and very outgoing, which probably was an excellent thing. Since he was so shy, she could bring him out of his shell, is I guess what I thought. Remember please, I'm trying very hard to look back as honestly as I can. All of us have to keep doing that to remember how it was not how it became if we're all if we are going to attempt this story she was pretty and funny and in the beginning it seemed like she wanted all of us to be friends and get to know each other and well all those normal things also we are a family that believes in hard work and trying to do your best you can and when we met her she was driving a Cadillac Escalade from the company she she said she worked for Dirty South and then there was her house not a lot of money and big houses don't mean anything to me personally. I don't want to live anywhere but in our little 1100 square foot house until the day I die. But I know those things are important to a lot of people and that's fine. Hard work, whether it's for your own personal satisfaction as well as putting a roof over your head, no matter how small or large seems to me to make people feel good about themselves. And the roof Shanann had put over her head with her hard work was as big was a big one. In fact, it looked like a mansion. It was it was as Sarah commented to me, the biggest and grandest house she'd ever seen, then or now. It had been three it had three formal living rooms for heaven's sakes, and each one of them, well every room had the most beautiful beautiful furniture I'd ever seen in all of them. It sat right beside a lake, and there was a boathouse too. For the people who lived in the subdivision, I'm guessing that a boat wasn't out of the question. Her bedroom was massive and beautiful. She had these little clocks and things. She said she ordered from Switzerland. It was perfect, like a castle. And she said she had bought and paid for it from her job at Dirty South by the age of 25. She told me, in fact, that when she had approached the builders and told them what she wanted, they didn't take her a bit seriously until she opened up a suitcase she had brought and pulled out $20,000 in cash. You had to be impressed with that no matter what. I saw years later that her brother Frankie said that she was always a hard worker and was making half a million a year. 
And to maintain that house, I think you would have to be pulling that in. Like I said, she was also driving a company car from Dirty South, though she had told Sarah that she was either taking a break from there or had quit. Sarah isn't positive which, and that she was working as a nanny at the time instead. She also mentioned that she had worked at Gap previously, so I don't have any idea how she managed it all. She didn't come from any more wealth than Chris had. Just nice, ordinary people, and if she had won the lottery, which I could have believed, she didn't mention it, and she would have. Because right from the start, Shanann pretty much said everything she thought and told us a lot about her life. We heard right away about her lupus and fibromyalgia and her migraines, the endometriosis and celiac disease she brought up later. She told us she was divorced from a man who she had put through school and that he had been physically unattractive and that despite that, he had also cheated on her. She also told us she had recently been in a single car accident and had hurt her neck. She said she might have said she'd gone through the windshield too, but I can't be sure. She seemed to be healthy and happy all the times we saw her, so I suppose she was just a very strong person. At any rate, despite some confusion on how she had managed the house or where she worked, I think she just dazzled Chris. Sure, he was supporting himself and doing really well, especially for his age, but she was living in a house that cost nearly half a million dollars and had furniture and art inside that was probably worth half that again, and her car was an Escalade after all. So if she started talking to him right away about what to do with money, he most probably would have listened to her. He certainly seemed to be listening to everything she told him right, right from the beginning. Chapter 2 Chris lived and worked in Charlotte, and so we didn't see much of him as we would have liked, and he never exactly been the chatty type on the phone. I'm, the, I'm sort of that person, too, who figures no news is good news. I knew he had, had a pretty new girlfriend and worked, and I didn't worry. He talked to his dad by phone, and I knew if there were any problems, Ronnie would tell me, and he didn't mention any, so why worry? We met her parents when they came up, and her brother, and they seemed like nice people. I'll admit, I'll admit too, that I wasn't looking forward. I wasn't looking to get really close to Shanann, not because I disliked her, but because her conversations were so personal that they made me feel a little uncomfortable. There are lots of people who like to tell you everything about themselves when they meet you, but I'm not one of them, and that's okay in both directions. I think. Like I said, I wasn't worried. The first time I did become a little concerned was at our grandson Wyatt's third birthday party. Sarah was pretty pregnant then with Ruby, and the party was just going to be a small backyard one. Wyatt, like most little boys, had a Power Ranger toy he liked. Shanann knew about this, and she suggested that it be a Power Ranger party. Our daughter is a pretty easygoing girl, and so she didn't mind if Shanann wanted to help out or whatever. At any rate, one of Shanann's ideas was that she and Chris show up at the party dressed as Power Rangers, and I guess she got him to rent the outfits or buy them. I'm not sure which. But when the day came, Chris had forgotten the helmets, bearing in mind that it was a three-hour drive from where he lived to Sarah's house and that Wyatt was three and that all of us were just happy he could come. It took, all, took us all back when Shanann told him in no uncertain terms that he was going to turn right around and drive straight back three hours to get the helmets and then return. A six hour trip and obviously another three hours back home for a total of 12 hours on the road and for what? We asked, we all asked him that. Told him not to go, don't be silly, why it could care less, just stay, enjoy yourself, visit with us, relax, we said. But it was Shanann he was looking at for approval already and he looked anxious. We'd never seen him look that way. Chris was always a relaxed kid and a young man, but she told him to go back and get those helmets and that's just what he did. I guess that was the first time we began to worry. It was just the beginning. Chapter 3. Like every other family, when their adult child falls in love, it wasn't going to matter what we thought about their kid's new love interest. What would matter is what we said, which if you ever want to have a continuing relationship with your child better be nothing at all and so that's what we did I mean who knows people on the internet call me a crazy possessive mother 
and Chris seemed to allude to that a little bit in his first interview. My mom was a little hesitant. The detective jumped in. Yeah, losing her baby and all, he shrugged and smiled. I have to admit, I was a little taken back by his answer because this was just a few weeks after Shanann had written about me on Facebook and she'd written a lot, saying, amongst other things, that Sarah was the golden child and that Chris was always second. Sometimes you really can't win. The simple truth is that I have always been crazy about both of our kids and so is Ronnie. But yes, I have been extremely close to my daughter who's an astounding young woman and who, with our beloved, very nice son-in-law, generously shared time with their children and themselves with us. That doesn't mean I loved her more. We just had more in common. For example, we'd like to talk to each other. Something Chris and Ronnie definitely had in common was that they did not have to talk much when together. Not that you talk anyway at drag races or NASCAR unless you like to speak with bullhorns. Ronnie's closeness to Chris does not mean he loved him more than Sarah. There are just untrue things and they are hurtful from anyone. There's a good old fashioned poem about this that I guess everyone could agree on. A daughter is a daughter all of your life. A son is a son till he takes a wife. It just means really that you pretty much have to understand and accept that once your kids grow up and marry that things will be different and that if you want to see them and to keep peace you need to like their choices, whether you do or not, especially if you have grandchildren. I got lucky with Sarah's, Steve, not so lucky with Chris's choice, but I figured if it didn't have to be a disaster, we could be polite and friendly, and if so, maybe Ronnie and I would get every other Christmas with them, and that's the best any parents can hope for, really. So getting back to then, Chris was obviously in love, we were keeping quiet and going on with our lives, and a few weeks later, Chris called up to tell us that he just bought an engagement ring for Shanann. One, they had picked out together, and before I could say congratulations, he went on to tell me that he had paid $12,000 for it. I have to say, I was, in, I was shocked. $12,000 is a down payment on a house, or he could have paid off his car, or it was $1,000 more than he had in his life savings, and besides, he was an auto mechanic, not Prince William or Donald Trump. Maybe what I just said will make people laugh at me because maybe that's not a lot of money to other people, but it is to our family. I said, son, you know money doesn't grow on trees. Couldn't you have found something nice for less money? He didn't say anything, and I thought I handed the phone over to Ronnie. But I found out later he had told Shanam what I said, and she was really angry about it. I was sorry to hear that because I'd been trying hard to maintain a relationship with her during this time. She had the habit of saying confiding things to me and like I said, I'm not using I'm not used to someone I don't know being that open. Or maybe the problem from my standpoint was that all her confidences to me were about sort of pathetic she, my she found my son. It's possible I suppose that she blamed for his shortcomings and she hoped that by telling me how he couldn't even wash dishes right or cook or how the way he dressed embarrassed her and how she didn't like his hair or his weight either. He was too skinny that we could maybe collaborate on improving him together and become closer. I didn't like it though and I know it showed but now she was going to be our daughter-in-law and that meant that if Chris didn't mind her criticism, that I had better stop minding it for him. We'd make a new start, a reset. It would begin at the beach house that Sarah and Steve had already rented for a coming stay, a family week. Chris had already been invited, and we knew that he was bringing Shanann even before the ring announcement. The plan was for us all to spend time together and enjoy each other and witness the formal proposal she wanted him to make with the ring. Shanann managed to find a nearby beach house on the same street as the one our family was in for her family to stay in. That sounded good to a chance to start getting to know our future in-laws better and we could all become good friends before the wedding. Everything went okay at first. We were all happy to be on the beach. Chris and Shanann in particular loved being outside all day and they really were a beautiful couple. 
and they seemed to be in love and happy, and the Ruzcheks were delighted with our boy, and well, yeah, it seemed like this might end up well after all. Sarah and Stephen Wyatt and our brand new granddaughter were there and having a good time too. The sun shone, and at least from my perspective, our Wyatt was like having the sun around all the time. He's such a happy, handsome little guy always ready for an adventure, and for Wyatt, having Uncle Chris around was as good as Christmas. Chris was uncle and good buddy rolled up into one. He played with him and looked like he was having as much fun doing it as Wyatt. Little kids do know the difference between someone who really enjoys their company and someone who's doing it for show. They'll all admit they'll take the latter if the former isn't available. After all, it's better that not having any attention at all kids aren't stupid. So Wyatt didn't even want to eat breakfast first in the morning without including his pal Uncle Chris. He'd march right to the bedroom that Chris and Shanann were staying in and knock and holler good morning to helpfully wake up Chris so that he didn't miss any part of the fun. I guess like all adoring grandmas, and I am definitely one of those, I thought it was adorable. We all did. Well, not all of us, apparently. The second morning it happened, Chris found me in the kitchen and asked me to keep Wyatt away, Wyatt from knocking on their door. I was surprised and asked him why. He said Shanann didn't like it and it was ruining her morning sleep. I was annoyed and told him that he would, he could tell his sister this himself if he wanted it to stop and that he knew how much Wyatt loved him and that this would hurt his feelings. What was the big deal anyway? It wasn't that early. Chris looked a little embarrassed and shrugged and said, well, it's her vacation too, I guess. Anyway, that was the end of it as far as I knew. Something else happened that week, which was much worse, but our family doesn't discuss it, and it wasn't between me and Shanann and Chris didn't hear about it. The proposal happened during the week as well. Chris and Shanann went down to the beach with the photographer she hired, and Chris popped the question and said yes, and then posed for pictures that they later showed us. They were in their swimsuits and they looked young and beautiful and happy. Chris was still very slim and muscled then and so she was and everybody got a little choked up that there was going to be a wedding and then we all went home. And while I couldn't have said it had gone smoothly, I decided to try and not think about it anymore and just get on with things. Then I received an email from Shanann that shocked me completely. The gist of it was that she wanted me to know that she did not like me one bit. She thought I was a bad influence and a bad mother to Chris. She said that she knew I did not like her either. And the less we saw of each other, the better. I'd never said any unkind word to her. I felt like I'd been over backwards to welcome her into our family. And I also thought wrongly, obviously, that I had hidden my doubts about her. It would be a lie to say I wasn't completely devastated by the email. In my whole life, no one had ever said anything like that to me. Like, Chris, I'm shy. I don't get into arguments with people or raise my voice. I cried, and I showed it to Ronnie, who told me not to answer and just forget about it. My husband really can do things like that. I didn't take his advice. I wish I had now, because what does any of it matter anymore? It did then, though, and then is what I'm having to remember now. I wrote her back. I told her how badly she hurt my feelings. I told her that whether it looked like it or not, that I was trying. I told her that I didn't like the way she talked about my son or how she had acted with my grandson, but that at least I was making an effort. Then I think I told her that I wouldn't have ever written an email like this if I hadn't gotten hers. And it all seemed so stupid and petty now. And it was then, ugly and petty and as sorry a beginning as a family tried to blend could have. I didn't say anything to Chris though because they'd just gotten engaged and it would have upset him and Ronnie said not to and he was probably right. I don't know what I thought would happen but what I wanted to happen was for it to go away and not to ever have her or anyone really be as mean to me as that again or make me lose my temper as I had. I couldn't deal with things like this and up until then, I'd never had to. So having been hit and having responded to my shame, I decided to turn the other cheek and try harder. 
This, as it happens, was not a very good plan either. Chapter 4. Sarah was upset about the week at the beach and concerned that Shanann blamed any fallout on me. But she's not a young woman who likes problems or conflicts, and she's very definitely has her own life and a demanding career, so she just wanted to ignore any incipient family drama, and she advised me to do the same. That sounded good. So I decided to take her advice, and together we offered to throw a bridal shower for Shanann. It had been pretty obvious from the pick of the $12,000 ring and the public engagement that Shanann was going to want a big wedding. She said she'd never had one with her first marriage and that there are loads of women who want their fairy tale day. So we didn't think it was strange. Sarah had gotten married right out of college and we'd gone into debt to give her a nice wedding. And like a lot of young marriages, it hadn't lasted but a minute. Ronnie and I hadn't judged. We just shrugged it off. And if we thought of it all, we thought of how beautiful our girl had looked that day. Later on, when she married Steve, they just went up to the mountaintop and did it. But I know every girl wants that day once. Sometimes I think more for the wedding experience than the marriage. But whatever, I think isn't going to put much of a dent in America's queen for a day wedding industry one way or another. Anyway, it was obvious that she could afford to have any kind of wedding she wanted. There was the house and the car, and though we didn't think her parents could pay for a big wedding, we knew she could, so why not? Our family couldn't do anything elaborate because we simply don't have much money, but Sarah and I both like to cook and decorate tables and make party favors and that kind of thing, so we knew we could give her a pretty bridal shower and that she'd be happy and that would make Chris happy, etc., etc. We knew that Shanann wouldn't want a small bridal shower at either of Sarah or I's small houses, and so we rented a little clubhouse in Fayetteville. She had mentioned liking. It was attached to an apartment complex. Not a big space, but nice. Indeed, her second engagement party would be held there. We asked her for the names and addresses of all her girlfriends and wrote and sent out the invitations to them and her family members. I was the one who mailed them out, not Sarah. A week after the invitations had gone out, the only RSVPs we had were from members of our family and hers. I called Shanann up. I told her that we hadn't gotten any answers from her girlfriends. She gave me their numbers and I called each one. All of them said they had gotten their invitations but hadn't answered them because they each had different plans for that day and weren't going to be able to make it. There was one exception who said she had been planning to RSVP and would be there. Sarah and I had worked hard on the shower and I thought it looked beautiful and our family and hers were there and she got gifts and lots of attention, but she wasn't happy. You could tell she wasn't. I just didn't realize how unhappy she was until years later when Sarah and I saw the discovery documents. Chapter 5. Hello again readers. I know this is an unusual way to do a book, but bear with me dropping in on you and Cindy from time to time. There is a lot of sometimes boring research that goes into people's life stories and sometimes it needs to come into the book anyways. This chapter is different and spoiler alert, it's going to be a run long. There are 1,960 pages in the Chris Watts discovery file. There's a great deal of minute and some repetition, but there are also pieces of the lives of Chris and Shanann and his family and hers that I think show some fairly terrifying writing on the wall and might help to answer the enormous why of this family's grotesque ending. The following pages are both a letter that Sandy Ruschek, Shanann's mother, wrote to Detective Dave Balmover of Weld County in Colorado, which details out her memories of her interactions with the Watts family and their answering memories of these same events. Memory is a funny matter. I've spoken to Dr. Saul Kassan, the expert from Making a Murderer, and it seemed that any one of us can have a false memory if we are frightened or upset. And the time Sandy wrote this, she was suffering from the worst kind of shock and grief a human can experience, murder. It, ten it tends to wipe out every good thing that came before it. It makes you ask yourself if there ever were any good moments at all, or if you just remembered them wrong. That's true for all of us at any given time. In fact, 
Cops hate to take eyewitness statements at car accidents. They never get the same story twice. Nobody ever gets the color of the car the same. And yet, are those witnesses lying? If they are, are they conscious of it? Memory is subjective, and so here are both families' memories. I'll leave it to you, the reader, to decide what to believe. The letter from Sandy Ruzchek is here without spelling changes and includes rebuttals from Cindy, which will be in bold font, to try and avoid confusion on who is speaking. Thank you for your time, and I will see you in the next chapter down. Cheers, Kathleen. Attention, Dave Baumover. In 2009, Shanann built her house in Charlotte, North Carolina. Battling her lupus, her friend told her about her cousin, Chris, saying he was a very nice guy, quiet, etc. So Shanann got a request from him on Facebook months later. She called me saying, Mom, I met a nice guy. He's a mechanic. I said, as long as you're happy and he's good to you. There isn't too much to add to this paragraph other than to say that the friend of Shanann's was our nephew's former wife, Nicole Kennedy, and that during this time, we were still confused about how to pronounce Shanann's name as her parents always referred to her as Shannon, and then Chris announced that he was going to change the spelling of his name at her suggestion to Christopher, and all admit we laughed at him. We never heard about Christopher again. A few months after that, Shanann and Chris had a family gathering and Frank. I and his parents had a cookout. They were all floored when they saw her house. Shanann was a hard worker and wanted this to eventually sell and make a profit to keep doing so eventually be mortgage free. Comes from a family of contractors. The barbecue where we met we first met Shanann's parents was at their house in August of 2010. It's a nice middle class home. I've already mentioned that Shanann was much more open and talkative about personal matters than I am. I found her mother Sandy to be much of the same. In the first few minutes that we met, she pointed at Frank Sr. and said, I've only had three good years with that man. Shanann had previously told us that her father was an alcoholic and that her brother had drug problems, which was a conversation I felt badly about. As I don't believe in airing family problems, at the time she had spoken, I wondered if Chris, in this new kind of tell-all relationship, had told her about our family privates, our private pain. My husband, in 2003, developed a cocaine problem which lasted for an entire year. Chris had been at college at the same time, and we had never spoken of it outside our small family. But I figured when Shanann had said that about her father and brother, that Chris, or as he was temporarily known, Christopher, had shared that with her. So I was uncomfortable and sad when Sandy said that about her husband. I didn't know either if it meant that he had been sober for three years and that's how she was happy, or if he had started drinking after their first three years, and I didn't ask. So Shanann was eager to please his parents, wait on them hand and foot. When Shanann left the back porch and it was just me and Chris's mom, she leaned over to me and said, Shanann was married before? I said, yes, just like your daughter was. And then later again, when we were alone, she said, I just don't see it. I said, what? She said, I don't feel or see that your daughter loves my son. I knew she was going to be a thorn in the marriage because my mother-in-law was the same way. This is a painful process, I won't lie to any of you. I'd never read this before. I didn't read the discovery documents. I've been in a bad place since the murders. I guess I wish I had read it, but I also wish I had never spoken publicly at all during the time, because then I also believed everything my son told me. And that is, as I'm finding out, no more truthful than this letter of Sandy's. Anyways, Kathleen sent the letter to me when we were at the beach last week, and now I have to read it, and so now I want to answer it. The conversation that Sandy refers to about my remarks regarding Shanann loving my son did, in did indeed take place several years later following an argument and then an apology I made. I'll get to that later. As, far, as for the remarks about either her daughter being married before or mine, no, that never took place at all. 
this was a barbecue and we had just met and I don't have intimate conversations or at least I don't start them with people I don't know. Sandy did over time let me know that she hated her mother-in-law but I can't remember how that came up and it certainly wasn't on this occasion. If she thought about me as Shanann's future mother-in-law, I didn't know and she didn't say. So every time we had a cookouts, his mom and sister were very quiet and distant. We weren't accepted. That They made us know. I guess all I can say to this is we are pretty quiet family overall. Ronnie's extremely quiet and Sarah is one of those people who truly believes if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. Her husband, Steve, is also quiet. It's true. So is Chris, and all of us hate arguments. I think I can see how a more extroverted type of family might view us as distant. But we weren't trying to be. It's just the way we are. If there is a person in our family who shows emotion or loses their temper, I guess that would be me. But I promise that before our son had met Shanann, began the relationship, I can remember a single incident I can't remember a single incident where I had before. I usually just put my head down and try to forget about things. Their dating and marriage changed me and not in a way I'm glad of. So forward to engagement party. Shanann and shopped for food, wine, etc. Spent a lot. Chris's sister wanted all the invitations so she could help. So Shanann told me, Mom, she wants to help send off the invitations. What do you think? She's accepting me. I'm going to let her do it. So this mom and sister prepped food and cross-contaminated everything. So Shanann couldn't eat any of it. Gluten-free, nothing. Everything was made with gluten. So thank God I brought at least my daughter could eat. So as the night went on, Shanann and I went to the bathroom and Shanann told me, Mom, I have like 80 invites. Only immediate family came. So Shanann called people the next day to learn they never received an invited. Shanann was devastated. I'm not sure where to start. Maybe I should begin by explaining that by the time my daughter and I had thrown a bridal shower for Shanann in October of 2012, Chris and Shanann were living in Colorado. They had moved there and in the Dietzes in May of 2012, Chris had taken a job with Longmont Ford. We didn't have any gatherings before she flew back to North Carolina for pre-wedding stuff. As to for the engagement party, I'm assuming is what Sandy is speaking of. The bridal shower we gave her, which I've already addressed. Shanann's second engagement party was given by Nicole Kennedy who was Shanann's matron of honor, and we had nothing to do with food or invitations or anything at all. In fact, we didn't even attend that one. I heard about it later from family friends who did. Apparently, Nicole made a toast and said it humorously. I know there are people who would like to kill me for bringing these two together. Now, I guess I better explain our absence from the second engagement party. There had been an earlier engagement party that was thrown by another friend of Shanann's. Ronnie and I did go. And for whatever reason, we seriously screwed up in Chris's eyes because he called the next morning and said we had really embarrassed him the night before. This came out of the blue to Ronnie and me, and I was particularly upset by it. So we canceled our plans to attend the second party so as to avoid embarrassing Chris again. If you're beginning to wonder if I ever realized that it was only Shanann who didn't seem to much like us, or at least like me, yeah, I didn't catch that a while back. What I didn't see was this. If you had me ask if I had a good relationship with my son before he met and fell in love and married Shanann, and if I thought that he loved me, I would have answered yes to both. I would have blamed her for how he had begun to treat us, but I don't know now if that was true. I have to wonder. What I still don't question is that I have always loved him and that I always will. But I guess if you're wondering if I know him or ever really did, again, I would say I thought so once and now I don't. Shanann and Chris were upset so they knew not to ask again. Then came the wedding. No one from the whole family came, just his grandmother and uncle. No mom, dad, sister, aunts, and cousins. No one came. The next chapter I'm told dealing with the wedding and so I'll leave off answering the portion of Sandy's letter. I will tell you the following the wedding. I think I expected our son to apologize to us. 
but he never did. Instead, he wrote me the longest, ugliest email I've ever received. When Sarah came by the house later that day, she found me sobbing on the floor. She didn't comfort me. She said, get up, get up. This is not how things are now, and you have to face them and be strong. I tried to do what she said. It was good advice. Following the wedding, we did not hear from Chris until we contacted him April of 2012, after friends told us that he and Shanann had announced that she was pregnant on Facebook. Chris spoiled Shanann and vice versa. They were so in love. They were a great team. They moved to Colorado and lived with Shanann's friends for one year while they were building their house. Everything was great. Shanann saw something on Chris's private parts that didn't look normal. They went to the doctor's cancer, so it was removed. She saved his life. According to Chris, so I'll call this family hearsay, Shanann once saw a spot on his penis. We did once receive a picture of his penis. She sent to Ronnie's phone, then we deleted. Chris said she thought it was an odd-looking thing, but that he chose to ignore it. There was never a single doctor's visit that she never mentioned it again after taking the phone picture. Then Shanann got pregnant with Bella. Everyone was so excited and happy Shanann and Chris were wonderful parents. Chris and Shanann were, looking, were working at the Ford dealership in Longmont. Shanann was selling cars. Chris was head mechanic. A great team. Shanann was top sales. Then Bella came. So Shanann stopped working because of high-risk pregnancy. She was a trooper through the whole thing. Both families seemed happy. Chris's sister never flew to Colorado at any time they were out there. Shanann's pregnancy was announced on Facebook in April. We contacted them and everybody agreed to a fresh start. Ronnie and I don't have much money, but we bought the $600 stroller she had asked for as a gesture of goodwill and Sandy's right, both families seemed happy. We were, I think, maybe more relieved than happy. I mean, we were very happy about a new grandchild. But by then, we were so upset that Chris had refused to talk to us for months. Then we had, long before, begun blaming ourselves for it. We had to make up for not going to the wedding. We would do whatever he wanted. Whatever she wanted. I don't know how long Shanann was at Longmont Ford. A few months, she, she quit while pregnant. It was not a high-risk pregnancy. And there were no fertility drugs as far as we knew. They were married in November, and she got pregnant by February or March. And usually four months is not considered a long time trying for trying period for a baby. Chris was not the head mechanic at Longmont Ford. That can take years, and he was only there about a year. He was a line mechanic, but he was working six days a week and making between sixty to eighty thousand during the year. It's probably how he was able to qualify for the house in Frederick. Shanann did not get any money from her house in North Carolina and had to sell it furnished. Whatever happened during the sale must have hurt her credit, so Chris had to apply for the loan alone. His job at Longmont Ford was a really good one for him, but it was six days a week, and that annoyed Shanann. She told him he had carpal tun tunnel syndrome from the work and needed to quit. So he did, and began at an Anadarko's at about 20000 less than he had been making. They did not build their house. It was a pre-planned subdivisions, and that was one of the different models available, the largest one at the time. Later, some had three-car garages. Cindy and Ronnie came two times a year. Shanann worked at Children's Hospital at night and sold 31 bags, travel bags, on the side. Everything was good. Shanann got pregnant with Celeste, and pregnancy was really rough on Shanann with her lupus. Very high-risk pregnancy again, but only this one was worse for Shanann. Water weight gain, severe back pain, shortness of breath, pains in her chest, fatigue, exhaustion. If Shanann was having a high-risk pregnancy, no one, including either she or Chris, mentioned it. She looked fine, seemed happy and healthy, and Bella was a beautiful, happy baby. I think they were probably struggling financially, though. Shanann had been given some shift work at a children's, as Sandy said. Her friend Jenna Dietz was there as a nursing supervisor, but the shifts were infrequent. I don't know if she made any money or not on the handbags. They were young, and they had a baby with another one on the way, with a huge mortgage, and only one car, Chris's Mustang. 
they didn't have any furniture, so they ran up some pretty high credit card bills furnishing the house. So I guess so they probably did feel somewhat overwhelmed and want, wanted some help from Sandy and Frank. I think family's important too. I worked for 30 years in credit control, and when Ronnie and I had our babies, my mom watched them during the day. And when I retired, I started, I started getting to have Sarah's baby during the day, and it's a fine thing, a blessing in life. I think that was one of the reasons we were so surprised when they moved to Colorado with the family. We weren't thinking at the time there would be any babies for them, though. Shanann had told my best friend at their post-wedding breakfast, Oh, Sydney's going to be so mad at me again. I have endometriosis and won't be able to have any children. I shrugged it off. She had already told us that she had lupus and fibromyalgia and celiac disease. I guess I hadn't ever thought about grandchildren from Shanann and Chris, and I didn't mind. We have grandchildren, so it was quite a surprise that she ended up being able to have babies, but a nice one. Sometime during the year before Cece was born, Frankie had come out to stay with them. Shanann said it was to help him with his drug problem. I don't know if Frankie ever had a drug problem or not. She also told us that he had, he and her mom were both bipolar. I'll admit, I thought Sandy could be a little overbearing, but she wasn't crazy or anything, and Frankie is just a sweetheart, always has been. I guess if I thought anyone was bipolar around there, it was Shanann. At any rate, he left after a few weeks later, telling us he hadn't much liked being there. Butler. I thought it was funny. He'd always been a very nice kid, Frankie, and our whole family likes him a lot and are sorry that we can't talk anymore. One thing to be sorry about. It's true that Sarah never went to Colorado. She wasn't interested. For the matter, Frankie never went back either, so it wasn't until Shanann came for her six-week stay in 2018 that either Sarah or Frankie got to meet Cece face-to-face -face for the first time. My husband sold everything but our, our hours and moved out to live with them to help our daughter in every way we could. Frank and I had to work to pay our bills too. We were there for 15 months. Sandy is right. They did just that. They sold everything they had, including this really pretty pond with a koi in it. They moved to Colorado, and despite Shanann and Chris having a five-bedroom house, Sandy and Frank were put down in the unfinished basement. The way the bedroom situation worked was very specific. Master bedroom for Chris and Shanann, the girls each had their own room, and that was never open for discussion because they might keep each other awake. The remaining rooms were Shanann's office. I think she was selling both Unique and La La Rue, by then, and the girls' playroom because Shanann didn't like toys in their bedrooms. So Shanann, excuse me, so Sandy and Frank had the basement. They also, according to what Sandy told me, had to pay $1,000 a month and were there to help with the kids. At the time they came, Chris and Shanann told us that it had been Frank and Sandy's choice al alone because they wanted to be near their grandchildren. That made sense to me and Ronnie. But I think it was hard on them financially because they had to pay their mortgage on their house in North Carolina where Frankie was still living and pay rent in Colorado too. They both had to get jobs. Sandy was a hairdresser and so got work doing that. And Frank drove a delivery truck for either Lowe's or Home Depot. I can't remember which for sure. Their jobs helped with their finances but left Shanann short on child care during the day. So she enrolled both girls at the Primrose School. Chris's mom came out to watch the girls for a few days while Shanann and Chris went on a business trip with Lavelle, her company, four nights and five days. During that time, we weren't allowed to see our grandchildren or even eat dinner with them as soon as we got home. She brought them upstairs and stayed upstairs. She wouldn't let us hold them or anything. I found that very odd. One day I asked her, why? She said, what the hell am I here for then? She screamed in my face in front of my granddaughters and said that I was very controlling. I was just like, wow. I texted Shanann over and over again and said, uh, relax. And she said, relax, mom. I'll take care of it when I get home. It was ridiculous. I never spoke to Chris's mom again. I'd have enough. I'll give Sandy this much. That was a pretty disastrous trip to Colorado. Chris and Shanann had asked me to come and take care of the girls so they could go too. I think it was Punta Cana for a Thrive thing, which Shanann's, which Shanann had started selling by then. 
I said yes. They sent me a ticket and Shanann offered to keep the girls in daycare if I wanted, but I said no. And the three of us had a good time during the day in their subdivision. It was very nice there and all set up of four families. Sandy didn't seem to want me there and made me nervous by getting angry at me after she said I scratched one of Shanann's frying pans. The part about the girls not eating dinner downstairs is ridiculous. No one in their right mind would have tried to eat food anywhere in Chris's in Chris and Shanann's house except the kitchen counter or the dining room if they knew what was good for them and I had to keep their totally set in stone bedtime ritual snack shower or bath Tylenol bed by seven at the latest no exceptions one evening when Sandy had gotten home from work the girls wanted me to take them to the basement where their bouncy house was I did and Sandy got in with them and they were having a good time fine then Sandy said I needed to bounce too. I said, no, I just watch, she told me. You don't know anything about children, Cindy. I was mad, I'll admit it. Then it got worse because it was 6.30 and I had to keep the girls on their schedule. So I took them upstairs and they weren't happy. I don't blame them, but those were the rules. They both had tantrums and Sandy came storming up and told me I was doing it wrong. Not sure what it was, but it was wrong. I'd had it and I did scream. What the hell am I here for? And I did do it in front of Bella and Cece. Then I stomped off downstairs and sat on the couch and cried. And then I just walked back upstairs and found Sandy and Cece room and I apologized. We actually had a nice talk after that and she told me she loved Chris but that he didn't speak up enough. When Chris and Shanann got back there was some big fight between Sandy and Shanann and Sandy packed up their car. Her dogs included in such a hurry that she didn't even have time to say goodbye to the girls or Chris. Shanann asked Frank to let her go and stay with her, but he didn't. He got in the car, too, and they drove back to North Carolina, and that was that. After 15 months, I moved back home. It was hard to believe, but I felt it was for the best. It was hard to believe, but I felt it was for the best. I have been home now, 17 months later. My whole family is dead. My beautiful daughter, beautiful grandchildren, all dead. God help us all. They are all dead, and he killed them, and I don't have any answers, just grief and endless regret. Did I make them this way? Should I have done more, done less? What could I have done differently? Could I have stopped it? I miss those little girls. I will always miss them. But what is worse is that they lost their lives. All the long years that belonged to them by right, he took those years. And I don't know if he understands at all what he has done to us and the Ruschecks, the people left behind. I always told myself he was like Ronnie because Ronnie has always been quiet, but he's nothing like Ronnie. I don't know. I spend all day and night a year later still trying to find something, anything that I missed and I must have, but I don't have any answers. We have grief. It will always be with us. I know grief. It walks with me. I know confusion and despair, but I don't think I know. He understands at all what he has done to us and the root checks, the people left behind. I always told myself he was like Ronnie, my son. Everything seemed fine. Our daughter never spoke about anything bad. She did speak to us about bankruptcy, a lot of debt, with all the medical bills. Sandy and Frank were way ahead of us then. Chris never told us about bankruptcy at all. I found out later, after, and there wasn't much in the way of medical debt in 2015 when they declared. There was 70000 in unsecured debt, however. Stuff they'd bought somewhere in there. Chris had sold his Mustang to get cash for the Lexus down payment lease. By then, he had his work truck. When I look at the bankruptcy filing, so much money and for what? Clothes, trips they couldn't afford. Sandy and Frank had had, had to give them money for their passports for Putacana. If they couldn't pay for that, what in the world did they go on the trip for? Any of those trips that were really just parties, were they bought more overpriced clothes? This time, Thrive Stuff. It was crazy spending. Chris claims now he didn't know how bad their money situation was. I say, really? 
Two years later, they were right there again, and it's not too hard to figure, is it? He was making 60000 a year. Their mortgage was 2700 Another one-fifth for homeowners, 2000 a month for daycare, 600 a month car payments, not counting insurance. They were already in the negative before utilities and food. So why not go on pricey trips and buy clothes and toys and get your nails done on Shanann's part? They treated money like Monopoly cash, and two short years later, they were underwater again, having learned nothing, and apparently neither had their banks, because how anyone was stupid enough to give those two credit is beyond me. Bella and Celeste were back and forth the doctors, been diagnosed for two years. I told Shanann that they had asthma, and she needed to fire that doctor's. One day, she went in at the PA, was there, and she diagnosed them with asthma. Finally, the girls were doing great. Other than earplugs put in at the girls being very allergic to tree nuts, which would have caused them death. It's true that both the girls suffered from failure to diagnose or to get the right, di right diagnosis that people in their lives seemed to need for them. Neither of the girls ever displayed any asthmatic symptoms when I was there, and Chris admits now that most he saw was CC coughing sometimes when she ate too fast. Bella did not suffer from any allergies at all. Despite this, she was told that whatever CC was allergic to, and sometimes that was chocolate, sometimes peanuts, and later tree nuts, she was not allowed any of those things either. Four is young for this. I don't know which of them. I don't know which of them. Chris and Shanann told her that if Cece ate coconut, she wouldn't wake up. I wish no one had. She was a very quiet, gentle, frightened little girl. And after the age of two, she never looked healthy. And her hair wouldn't grow. And she was self-conscious about it. Now I know she had the added worry of her sister dying on her little shoulders. Mama Bear Shanann called her. She wasn't a mama bear. She was a baby. But she was right to worry, I guess, because her sister did die, didn't she? Chris killed her. Killed them both. I don't think they had any allergies at all. I don't think they should have been dosed up with Tylenol every single night of their lives. And here's another thing that haunts me. The last day of their lives, they went to a birthday party. And there was cake and ice cream. And those babies had to stand there and look at it. None for them. Not even on the last day of their lives. Celeste was born with her esophagus too small. They went in three times to enlarge it. Steroids like crazy to help her breathe for a year and a half or longer. All until they were diagnosed with asthma. Then Shanann with her neck injury, which out of pocket 25000 they owed. So that's why there was so much debt. Sandy must be referring to the second go-around of debt here because Shanann's neck surgery was after the bankruptcy. It was elective and so costly, as were most of the tests on the girls. If CC was born with anything wrong with her, it sure never showed. She was the healthiest, most active, and happy little girl. I hate that she went through all of those procedures and all of those drugs. From birth, both girls were left to cry it out. Chris and Shanann said it was something called baby wise. I thought it was horrible. Two naps, two hour naps, unless they were at daycare. Drugs at 6 p.m. every night, every single night. Sick or not, bed at 6.30 or 7 at the latest. Those loud rain machines, I was told never to go into them when they cried. No rocking ever. I'd watch Bella crawl out of bed in the dark and crawl to her bookshelf then sit in the corner, hold a book she couldn't see in the dark. If the children had really had asthma, wouldn't have having let them cry like that have set off the asthma or Cece's choking? I noticed that when we would FaceTime every night for four years straight, looking back starting late May 2018, when we faced the time Chris was putting the phone all over the room, ceiling, floor, etc., I said, Chris, are you all right? Then he would FaceTime normally. Before Shanann came to North Carolina, Celeste had a rash on her private part, and she went to get a face cloth and some cream. Chris had the phone. I said, Chris, let me see how bad it is, being, the, being that I am aid. So I still couldn't see. So I said, wait, let me move my screen because I couldn't see. 
He put it right up to her private parts. Oh, I was mad. All I can say is this, is that they were, very, they were a very strange family. My son, his wife, her parents, or maybe I should say strange to me. From the beginning, I never seen anyone who never, and I do mean never, put their phones down like Shanann's meals, conversations, you name it. The phone was out. The phone caused unpleasant incidents the weekend of the engagement, but we don't talk about that. The phone sent Ronnie and I pictures of our son's penis. The phone was on, and not just when she was making videos. Her parents did indeed FaceTime with them constantly, and though Chris did what Shanann said always, he didn't ever warm to the videos, and constant FaceTiming and phone pics of every single minute, we didn't FaceTime every night. It would have been painful for one thing, as neither Ronnie or Chris talk much, and seeing how the kids ate dinner isn't necessary. Why did they take the phones into the bathroom? It seems odd. But then why did they take pictures of every time the girls were at the hospital? It was just all weird. So this unattractive story neither surprises me or makes me wish we had FaceTime more. Shanann wanted to come for six weeks this summer so she could introduce the girls to Chris's sister, who never met Celeste or Uncle Frankie, our son. Before the year started, back to school, dance, classes, etc. It was the best time was now. We were thrilled. Shanann stayed, with, stayed the week here, then the weekends with Chris's parents. Okay, I'm going to break off from this for a while. The rest of Sandy's letters concerns the last week's other lives, and there is a lot to tell before I get to that. I don't know why Shanann came to North Carolina for so long. They were facing losing their house and basically homelessness unless they moved back to North Carolina and in with one set or the other parents. Maybe it was to see how that would go. I'll give you a hint. Not well. Shanann looked at two very expensive houses for sale while she was here. Maybe she or they thought, I don't think it was they because Chris was already in love with another woman, but possibly she thought they could start over again in North Carolina like they had in Colorado. If so, I don't think it would have been easy. They weren't just broke. They were drowning in debt with little chance of getting out. They couldn't declare bankruptcy again. They were only two years out of the first one, so it really would have meant living with one family or the other, and if those weeks were any indicator, God help Shanann. She must have been growing desperate. Meantime, I have to wonder what Chris's solution was. Thank you for staying with me so far, and I will answer the rest of Sandy's letter later on. There's the book. All right. Like, subscribe, share, or don't. I'll see ya.